Um, thank you for attending Spokane Jewish Cultural Film Festival 2022 and tonight's Q&A with John Miller, uh, the director of the documentary short A Jew Walks Into a Bar. I am Neil Schindler. I'm the director of the festival as well as Spokane Area Jewish Family Services, which organizes the festival. If you have any questions or comments during the Q&A as an attendee here, please feel free to either put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself at an opportune moment and ask or comment in your own voice. Uh, a quick reminder, I've already given this to you guys, but whoever else watches, um, please rate the films using the virtual ballots on the screen pages. So without further ado, tonight's guest moderator, Nathan Weinbender, has worked as an entertainment writer for the Spokesman Review and as film and music editor of The Inlander. He co-hosts Spokane Public Radio's weekly film review program, Movies 101, and currently works, if I'm not mistaken, as a senior copywriter and content developer for the advertising, marketing, and PR firm DH. Did I get that right, Nathan? You got it right. Very good. Okay. And our featured filmmaker this evening is John Miller. John, do you prefer Jonathan? I never really got it straight. Uh, John's fine. John's fine. Great. John Miller um, is an editor for nonfiction TV and films whose work has appeared on Discovery, A&E, OWN, History, the Animal Planet, DIY, The Weather Channel, and Smithsonian, which to me is a pretty, that's a diverse portfolio there. It's impressive. Um, Standing Up, which is the documentary feature from which A Jew Walks Into a Bar is drawn, is his directorial debut. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Nathan and John. Thank you, Neil. Hi, John. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. And thank, where, thank where, both of you. Yeah, where are you zooming in from today or tonight? I'm in Nyack, New York, which is sort of 45 minutes north of the city. Got it. So it's late night for you then. I, I'm kind of a night owl, so um, okay, well, pretty so early for me. <laughs> worked out. Got it. Well, Neil kind of rattled off some of your credits, uh, which is a good segue into what I wanted to start the conversation off with, which is sort of your background. Um, I mean, just looking at your resume and seeing, uh, you know, reality television as well as, you know, uh, documentary features. Uh, can you kind of explain how you got into this industry in the first place and just sort of what drew you to film? Um, yeah, I, I, I knew throughout, kind of throughout college, I wanted to go into nonfiction and, and in some capacity, I didn't know if I wanted to be a journalist or so on and so forth. It was sort of, um, I, I think it was like Errol Morris's film sort of opened my mind to like the different ways that, you know, nonfiction um, could be used to explore many different things, you know, kind of beyond the news cycle and, to, you know, think about things philosophically and, you know, different modes of storytelling. And um, that really wanted me to, you know, maybe want to get into the space. Um, as far as, you know, becoming an editor, that just kind of, kind of happened. I got hired um, to edit uh, like a home improvement show shortly after college and, you know, kind of kept doing it. Got it. I'm kind of curious about the process of working as an editor for, say, a home improvement show or, you know, a Discovery Channel documentary, uh, how it compares to editing, putting together a documentary feature, especially one that you've directed. Can you sort of talk about those different modes and um, like, are they two different parts of your brain or are they like surprisingly uh, similar uh, when you actually are like, you know, in the editing room, figuring things out? Um, it's pretty, it's pretty different. I mean, usually when you're cutting something for TV, this, you know, it's a lot quicker. There's a lot more parameters um, when you're cutting a, a feature. And so just to be clear, I, edit, um, I, I try not to uh, edit my own stuff. I have this um, Ken Bassett, brilliant editor who I work with a lot, um, has cut all of my films. Um, uh, but you, you know, I, I do put together documentaries for other people. And usually in that case, it's get, you know, you get a huge dump of like hundreds, thousands of hours of footage and it's just kind of like, you know, make it something good. That's interesting and makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, when you're doing something for TV, it's like, you know, timelines are a lot shorter, else often someone else is writing it. Um, it, it's, it's much more about kind of like putting it together quickly and making it feel good, um, you know, and, and kind of knowing like the genre parameters that you're working within. And I imagine you have a lot of, you know, uh, network parameters as well. There are probably 
dozens, if not hundreds of people who are dictating how the show is going to look and feel even after you've submitted your final edit, I would imagine. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. I mean, you know, there's there's often like, uh, you know, it's a network, there's a many different executive producers, there's kind of the, you know, owners of the company, there's like a lot more voices versus like when you're just doing a documentary, it's kind of like, you know, you can listen to whoever, whoever you want, <laughs> you know, like we, we do a lot of like test screens, especially for this film, you know, how are people responding to the jokes, the story, the emotions, like are these, what are the themes that are coming through? Um, you know, it, it, I, you want to make the best film possible. And so you want to make sure people are tracking that, but that's very different parameters than, you know, if you're just doing it for, you know, a network, is it exciting enough to carry people through this ad break and, you know, so-and-so wants to hear about this thing. And it's, you know, it's very, very different experience. Yeah. Well, let's talk about um, your debut feature as a director then, which as Neil mentioned was called uh, Standing Up, which this short film was uh, sort of extracted from. Um, I'm sort of curious what led you to this project, uh, what attracted you to New York stand-up comedy in the first place and just kind of how this film came to be. Yeah, so uh, I had uh, two sort of producing partners I was working with um, and we were, you know, put our heads together. Um, we all loved stand-up comedy. And uh, we were sort of thinking about how there had been a lot of stand-up documentaries, um, but there really hadn't been kind of a, a hoop dreams like of stand-up comedy. Like people hadn't explored, you know, we went to a couple open mics and there's something really interesting about like, I don't want to say bad comedy, but people who are, you know, starting out very vulnerable in a very different place than, you know, sort of the polished, you know, stand-up sets that you're used to seeing. There's something like, you know, very compelling and interesting and, and sort of emotional watching people go through that journey. Um, and it's also very interesting that in New York, you have all these like really specific, interesting reasons why people are doing like stand-up comedy that, you know, I think David is a perfect example of like, um, you know, so just meeting all these, all, all these, 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 these characters and different people and, you know, especially David, um, it was, it, it just became clear that there was, there was something here and we wanted to follow it. And, and it ended up taking about three, four years of following their stories. Um, yeah, before we finish. So that are, yeah. And the, so that original feature follows three different comedians, right? Can you sort of explain how you came to choose them. And I mean, you know, as a former journalist, you look at an, an Orthodox Jewish man, Jewish man doing comedy. I mean, there's an, there's a hook in there that's like irresistible, right? But can you sort of explain how you chose the people that you chose and uh, how David ended up being one of the three? Yeah, so I uh, had previously uh, made my like thesis film in, in college was um, a sort of a profile of a Hasidic family. Um, and so, I, you know, I was sort of very familiar and I'm Jewish also, you know, I was very familiar with, um, you know, kind of Orthodox lifestyle. And uh, so as, as soon as I saw David and also like seeing how funny he was and talking to him and real understanding like how serious he was about like, you know, um, his religion and and being a stand-up comedian, it was like, okay, there's, there's obviously something like really fascinating <laughs> going on here. Um, and uh, the, the other people we chose were this woman who uh, she had been a recording engineer and she ended up um, pursuing, had to give that up to pursue stand-up, ended up becoming homeless and like still pursued stand-up like in spite of that um, and like was doing comedy like while she was, you know, basically in a shelter <laughs> and, and stuff. And, um, you know, that was very much informing her comedy. Um, and then we also filmed someone who was a personal injury lawyer who like, this was the very first, we filmed him the very first time he ever did stand up. He was like someone who was seen as like very funny in, in work and like we thought he was hilarious in life and lo and behold, it, it really did not work out for him initially on stage. Um, and that made for some, you know, sort of very compelling and vulnerable um, scenes and he got a lot better, you know, over the course of the film. Um, and so in terms of like, think, you know, we talked to a lot of people um, initially, like, you know, in many ways, this was, it was very difficult to cast, but it was also very easy to cast because it was like any open mic you go to, there's like, you know, 30 different really fascinating stories 
of like mostly talented people who like um you know all of whom probably would have been interesting to follow and would have made like very different films it, it was much more about thinking about you know how these stories are going to fit together um what were sort of the commonalities and what were the ways that they could contrast that would be interesting and i think one thing so, that was oh i'm sorry uh, oh, sorry, one thing going, that was sort of interesting um that we ended up realizing was like all of them i mean i think it's particularly clear for david but like all of them were sort of outsiders to comedy in a way who were like coming in. I mean, everyone's an outsider to comedy at first, but like they, you know, like especially um, they were coming from like a, a totally different world than most other comedians were basically. And, it, it, you know, um, were very, very much like stepping out of their bubble um, in order in order to do this. So there was some very personal like stakes for them. Yeah, no kidding. Well, so let's talk about David. Can you yeah. sort of um, talk about what it was like meeting him? Uh, you know, how you, I don't know if you would have to convince somebody to be part of a documentary, especially if, you know, they're kind of doing this surreptitiously in a lot of ways. Um, just, can you just kind of talk about that, how that relationship started? Yeah, um, so we, I, I saw him and I had also spoken to, um, one thing that we were doing when we were casting was we were going around talking to kind of the hosts of these different open mics because they know, you know, everyone, they see tons and tons of people. Um, and she had been like, of all the people who I see, like David is by far like, the, you know, the most interesting and the most talented, you know, like it is very clear. And it was clear to me also, you know, seeing him. Um, and he told me immediately, he was very transparent immediately about like, you know, his backstory, why he was doing this sort of, you know, things he was dealing with in terms of anxiety. Um, and, you know, it, it just like, imme like immediately was like clear, you know, for we had been doing sort of like callbacks and stuff, but like, as soon as I saw him and he uh, was interested in, you know, being on camera, it was like, okay, <laughs> we're, we're going. Um, and we were filming with him immediately. And um, he was, you know, I mean, he was, pursuing stand-up comedy so he was out there in the world you know so do, you know doing a documentary wasn't that much further out certainly like you know he didn't want to take us back to his you know his home and you know we didn't meet his family and and, and clearly like from the movie but um that uh you know in terms of his comedy life and some of the things around it like that you know that was all he was happy to talk about that yeah. So did you get any glimpses at all into his life outside of, you know, him being in these comedy clubs? Because, you know, you, you get like you've got 25 minutes of, of footage and it's mostly him out on the streets of New York and being in the comedy clubs. But I mean, even with or without a camera, like, did you spend much time with him outside of when you were you know, actually filming him? Yeah, we, we I mean, we became good friends. We hung out quite a bit. I mean, and it, and it was, you know, um, the the process of making the film even though like much of david's story unfolded very quickly like um i think a lot of the major events that you see like happened within the first six months we did continue to film like over the course of four years so you know um you you do just inherently like become fairly you know close with your subjects like when you're filming with them on a project like this over a very long period of time um so yeah for sure but um you know we're definitely a part of his comedy life, you know, not like David has, has many different life. He has a job now, he has his family, you know, so. Um. Got it. Well, and I, I do want to get into the, you know, the where are they now element. Don't worry, I will get there. But um, sure, sure. I, 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 I still have a few questions about the, you know, the filmmaking process. Um, I mean, you're following somebody for months and then years. I mean, were there things about David or things about, um, you know, just like his lifestyle or about just, you know, his religion that maybe surprised you or things that you didn't know about that you learned from him and, and from observing him. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, oh yeah. I mean, I learned so much from him. Like <laughs> it was uh, initially like when we were hanging out, it was a lot of just me like asking him like many, many different questions. Um, but uh, I did not expect the story to unfold this way. I mean, I, I knew there was, you know, he was in sort of a vulnerable situation, you know, he was, he was kind of keeping it this 
side of him secret and there's all these inherent contradictions that you see in the film um but I, he he just showed up one day in jeans like i I didn't, I didn't know that was, that was going to happen. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had to be like, wait, 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 can we get that on camera? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't, when he, he took, I didn't know he was going to take his hat off and go through all this transformation. I didn't realize like the, how, how he, uh, like, uh, as you see, like in the film, he has this conflict about um, talking about, being, being orthodox and not wanting to be seen as like just a stereotype. He wants his, you know, comedy to be deep, to be deeper than that. He wants, it's about more than that to him. He wants it to feel really honest and personal and he wants to be respectful of his, his religion. Um, and uh, I, you know, that I thought that was like a really like very fascinating and layered con conflict. And that was something I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get from the get go. I thought he was just going to be, you know, kind of this, guy with like a really unique style of comedy but was mostly talking about being like this orthodox Jew in this in this you know very non-orthodox world well yeah there's definitely a moment where you get the sense that he starts to worry that he might be his own punchline in a lot of ways that that he is he doesn't want to be a gimmick comedian um and that i mean the arc that he goes through over the course of you know 20 plus minutes is pretty remarkable. Uh, so in the amount of time that you film, so we're, we're seeing 25 minutes. So what is that in his life? Like a year and a half longer? Um, much of it takes place within the first, within like five, six months. And then I think the last two scenes, you know, one was filmed like maybe a year out and then one was another like two years out or something. Um, like it, uh, basically we, uh, we're still filming pretty significantly with the other two characters. Um, their stories hadn't unfolded as quickly um, and were about things like getting better at comedy, which it takes a lot longer <laughs> than, uh, you know, uh, David's whole, pro whole process kind of like unfolded very quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, we, because we were still kind of out there filming, like we kept checking in on him and, you know, when things would happen, when there would be, a significant amount of new material or you know kind of a life event that affected his comedy life um we would come back to him and you know film with him then too was there anything that you captured um over the course of that time that you weren't able to fit into the movie either because you didn't have enough time or there just wasn't a place for it that you really wish you could have included um <laughs> you know i to to be honest with you, I, I, there were a lot. Um, I don't have any on the tip of my tongue. We finished this film um, over four years ago now. So, wow. Yeah. So let's get into the editing process then, because you mentioned that, you know, you're not the primary editor of the films that, that you're directing, but obviously you have experience in editing and editing documentary material. Can you sort of explain, um, because I'm not totally familiar with the process of putting together a documentary from an editing standpoint, can you kind of explain what it's like to cull down, you know, hundreds of hours of footage into, you know, a feature length film or a short length film? Um, it's very difficult. It's a very long-term process. And I mean, we were, <clears throat> we were editing while we were still shooting. Um, but I, I think I started editing like, you know, six months into the process and we, it, the whole film took like, you know, four years plus to, to, to finish, to finish, you know, we were shooting and editing, coming back to it and, and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very difficult. I, I, the way I think about it is I, I try to constantly have a blueprint in my head for like how the film is, is, is playing out. So I know like what I'm shooting and, and what it's going to be, but I also am constantly aware that I always need may need to like throw out that blueprint on a moment's notice when something unfolds in their life where I figure out a new way to like you know use a particular piece of footage um there's just you know you keep thinking like you've come to all the different possible ways you could possibly put something together and then you break it and you realize something else completely works you know um, and I think this is true of like, you know, this was a particularly long editing process, but I think most documentaries take about, can, you know, six months to a year to, 
in post-production. It's a, it's a very, very lengthy process. And, you know, people have note cards all like all around the, you know, on your bulletin board that get rearranged a hundred times. You do tons and tons of test screenings. Like things are all, you know, it's just, it's a monumental, like very difficult work in progress. Well, yeah, that's fascinating to think about that there's all this planning that goes into it and yet it could change at a moment's notice because, you know, real life, you know, uh, it has unexpected twists and turns. And I mean, I can think of a number of documentaries that they say, you know, when we were filming it, we didn't realize that's what the finished film was even going to be about, but X, Y, and Z happened and it kind of, you know, changed our focus. So you have to be on your toes. It, I mean, it's almost like being a stand-up comedian in a lot of ways. How's that for a nice... Uh, <laughs> commingling there. Um, so uh, can you, I, I kind of want to talk about the uh, response that you've gotten from people, because obviously this movie is, you know, a, a couple years old uh, at this point, at least the, the feature length uh, version of it is. And I, I know it's played at various film festivals, including this one. Um, can you just kind of talk about the, the general reaction you've gotten or maybe um, unexpected reactions that you've gotten from people that have seen it? Um. I don't, I don't think it's been that unexpected, to be honest, but people really connect with David, like everyone, you know, feels like, uh, you know, I think has kind of the same instinct that, that I have like across the board, it seems like, you know, the conflict he's going through, I think trans, you know, obviously, um, it's been very popular with like Jewish film festivals and people understand, you know, that, but I think it cross-culturally, like, you know, um, it's very universal, like the things he's dealing with. Um, and, you know, his brand of humor and sort of thinking about comedy and the need and to be like really honest and how this like helped him with, you know, these like ther therapeutic um, pr processes and stuff. I mean, um, a lot, you know, a lot of people have like, I think the funniest response to me is a lot of people have tried to like set him up. He's now, he's now married, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, I'll, uh, I'll address the, uh, the question in the chat here, uh, as, as good a time as any to, to talk about it, but, um, uh, is, is it okay if I, if I just read it or, or Rosla, do you want to ask it yourself? I'll read it. Okay. Uh, let's see. What are the characteristics of the other two comedians that are in the, uh, standing up documentary, uh, were, or are there any common themes and commonalities with David and does the entire film strive to compare and contrast elements of the three people, their comedy routines, et cetera. That's a good question. Maybe you can kind of um explain that and then also maybe tell people where they can they can see that film because i know it is available out there um yeah that's a great question and uh so i think some of that uh emerged when we were we were casting we were sort of thinking about like you know finding people who are in these kind of vulnerable situations who were kind of outsiders to comedy um, who, you know, were kind of stepping out of their comfort zone and also were risking something by doing this. So there would be sort of an emotional weight to, to their story. Um, and so I think um, because of that, there were, there were some things that ended up being like very interesting commonalities. Like all three of them were actually like quite religious, um, though, you know, uh, all different religions. Um, and, um, you know, like, uh, there's sort of natural themes that come up in people's lives anyway, <laughs> like, at, you know, love and, um, you know, one of, one of our characters had, uh, they're, you know, dealing with family and, you know, that all things that all comedians kind of deal with and, you know, kind of uh, trying to pursue this like very crazy um, sort of sometimes seemingly delusional, you know, um, career. Yeah, there's something, uh, I feel like it takes a special kind of person to be a stand-up comedian, because from what I understand, every stand-up comedian, they say their very first time on the mic, and maybe even the first dozen times they're on the mic, is, you know, humiliating and terrible, and, and, and it, you know, but you have to keep pushing through it, and you get better and better. Uh, so I guess my question is, like, having spent all this time around uh, comedians, not just the ones that you profiled, but all the ones that you, you know, interviewed and cast, and I'm sure observe do you think you're uh you would be more or less likely to try stand up yourself uh after all of that or i mean have you have you tried stand up yourself or is that something like you're you're not going to go anywhere near um i think i sort of in order to try to get uh closer to the subjects i deluded myself into believing that i was going to try stand up comedy at some point <laughs> uh, man and mm -hmm. 
um, the producers, you know, I was working together with, we all were sort of like, oh, like we're gonna do this. And we were kind of like writing jokes, uh, but really I think it was just to like, kind of like get, get close to them. I, I did, you know, sketch comedy in college and stuff. I was not very good at it. Um, I think part of, there was always like part of me that had this like dream of being a comedian, but it was not like a real, thing I wanted to pursue like it, it it seems like such a crazy thing to me and I realized I would have never you know I would have not been good at it um so uh no is the, is the, the <laughs> uh well I mean the big question for me I mean I think I'm sure everybody that sees this movie has the the same question at the end which is where is David now because by the end of this short he is sort of he's having this inner struggle uh, about his, you know, his faith and his love of comedy. And it also says he's taking a hiatus from performing, but he's still writing. And if I understand that would have been in what, 2018, 2019, maybe. So yeah, lay it on us. Give us the David update. <laughs> yeah. Um, so David, uh, as far as I know, he still does a show once a year on Christmas. Um, <laughs> And even though he, un, you know, most stand-up comedians, I think almost all stand-up comedians will tell you like they, it's not like riding a bicycle. Like if you don't do stand-up, you get worse at it. Um, for some reason that is, David claims it's true with him. I do not think it's true. I've seen the, the Christmas show a couple times and he does not do it in between during the year. And he's still like so good every year. Um, but uh, he, you know, I think is, is has pursued a couple of different writing projects. I'm not sure exactly where he's at with that, but he is mostly working in the field of um, home healthcare, basically. And you mentioned that he had uh, he had gotten married and and had a family. Is that? Uh, I, 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 I don't think that? I don't think he's had. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe he he has kids. Yeah, I, I I haven't spoken to him for a couple months, so he's he's gotten. Okay. I believe there was a marriage in between there. Got it. And do you know if his, he, there are times when he's on the phone with his with his mother and he mentions living at home with his mother. I mean, did you ever get a sense of how much she really knew about the comedy career, if she ever came around to it? Or was that something that he kind of kept at arm's length from you? Um, he no, no, he uh, did uh, event initially. He you know didn't wasn't talking about comedy generally to, to anyone. Um, he did at one point uh bring his mother to to a show and she said she appreciated that he wasn't um dirty basically <laughs> um so she, she think, liked that he didn't work blue yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> um i think uh those are kind of my basic questions about the film but um maybe uh fill people in on what you're up to or any future projects that they can be looking for so I, I, I recently had a film that I finished um, called The Interview that premiered on The New Yorker. Um, it was also it was at um, Doc NYC, a, AFI, and a bunch of other festivals. It's about um, the experience of going before the parole board um, in New York State uh, prisons for people with life sentences and kind of what that experience is like for them to have to account for, you know, like the worst thing they ever did um, in in five minutes to three strangers and have their their you know kind of future freedom resting on this. Um, so that that's called the interview and that that that's out now. That um, and we're kind of working on you know getting that out there. And we did a screening recently with like the New um, New York State Commission on Crime and Corrections and. Um, so uh, that's obviously like a very, very different, <laughs> very, very different project um, than, than this. Um, so, you know, I, I like to, you know, kind of work all over. And I know that uh, standing up the feature, uh, uh, it's uh, when I, I when I search on IMDb, there is a link to watch it on IMDb. So you can watch it that way. But is there a better way where maybe people can like send you some money to watch it or is that like the best place to stream it because we want to support you as much as possible i appreciate it you can you can watch it on amazon prime if you if you have an account there i believe um it's it's on a, available on a bunch of other streams but i think if you just google like standing up documentary comedy it should show you on the right like all the places it's available great um john anything else that you wanted to mention or are there any other uh questions out there that we haven't addressed already 
Uh, no, those are all great questions. And I, oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't have anything to say. So I, I really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. And, you know, I appreciate you guys having me and screening the film. And I, I think um, so, someone has questions. Yeah, go for it. Um, when David does his Christmas show now, which really should be called a Hanukkah show, um, does he wear, he transitioned into wearing jeans and the hoodie um, in one scene or more than maybe one. And what does he wear now? Is he back to his black suit with the hat or is he trying to be more, I guess, fitting in more with the genre of the comedian? Um, I think, well, for the most part, he is where he, in terms of that evolution, he is where he is at the end of the film, you know, unless, you know, he's not, it kind of varies where he's, you know, where he's at in life. If he's at home, he's maybe more comfortable wearing other things and so, and so forth. Um, it is a, a Christmas show because it's, it's on Christmas and it's a Christmas themed show. And it's the, all the comedians are Jewish, basically. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. It's kind of yeah. like it should be at a Chinese restaurant, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, and my friend who isn't Jewish, um, who has been watching the film festival, had a question that I thought was interesting. She wondered why, and I noticed it too, he wasn't wearing his um, hat or a yarmulke in some of the um, stand-up sessions. And was it just that we couldn't see the yarmulke? Because it just seemed very odd that he would leave his head uncovered. Um, well, you're um, very observant. There was maybe one session where he was not wearing it, but it became complicated to address from like a story, story standpoint. And it wasn't a thing that continued on after that. It was just like one mm -hmm. stand-up where he was in his experimentation with dress, he decided not to wear it that night. Okay. So yeah, but you do see him afterward and he's wearing it again. So yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, so yeah. Awesome. It's, it was one of those editorial decisions. You, you know, do you want to spend a long time explaining this thing or just, you know, kind of, but you're, I, I'm very impressed you noticed. <laughs> I was just surprised because, you know, that just seemed very uh, contrary to his beliefs. And my friend actually said to me she really appreciated that he would not perform on the Sabbath on you know Friday night or even Saturday. I guess he could in winter, but uh, it was you know sticking to his principles. But not wearing the yarmulke that time was really just baffled me. So just that one time. Here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. let him have that pass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was a great film. We really enjoyed it. And of course, now we're looking to watch Standing Up. So that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all the great questions. Yeah, and thank you so much, Nathan and John, for spending time with us this evening. And I really, myself, enjoyed the uh, Q&A. So thank you very much. And we're, we're so pleased to have your film in our festival. So thank you again. And best of luck with the rest of the festival. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, yes, Appreciate Catherine. it. Gather, do you want to say one more thing? Uh, yeah, I oh. do have one more question. I know this is a really far-fetched thought, but if we <laughs> wanted to go to this wonderful Jewish um, Christmas comedy show, <laughs> where is it and how would we sign up? Because I can imagine that it's not easy to get into, and I'm just fascinated. I have friends in New York. I could totally work around it. Um. I will need, would need to get back to you on that, but um, if you contact Neil, we can. Yeah, yeah. yeah let me yeah. know, John, and I'll pass it along. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's who knows? One day it might happen. Yeah, so we'll all fly you. over and watch it. Yeah. Wouldn't that be the, the Spokane <laughs> contingent? Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll have to go out for Chinese food. <laughs> perfect. I'm from Detroit. Oh, yes, you can you you almost Detroit, walk right. there. You're much closer than we are. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, have a wonderful evening, and uh, John, I, I hope you have a restful night, and uh, I'm sure I'll see all of you uh, before too long. So take care, everyone. Thanks very Thanks, much. Thanks, everybody. All right. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks.